Welcome back to Pre-stressed Concrete Structures. This is the sixth lecture of the ninth module on special topics and this is the concluding lecture of this course. First, today we shall learn about circular pre-stressing. After the introduction, we shall study the general analysis and design. We shall then study about specifically on pre-stressed concrete pipes liquid storage tanks and ring beams and finally, we shall conclude. When the pre-stressed members are curved in the direction of pre-stressing, the pre-stressing is called circular pre-stressing. For example, circumferential pre-stressing in pipes, tanks, silos, containment structures and similar structures is a type of circular pre-stressing. In these structures, there can be pre-stressing in the longitudinal direction, which is parallel to axis as well. Circular pre-stressing is also applied in domes, shells and folded plates. Here we have to be clear that if a tendon is passed through a curved profile within a linear member, it is not called as a circular pre-stressing. The member itself has to be curved to term the pre-stressing as circular pre-stressing. The circumferential pre-stressing resists the hook tension generated due to internal pressure. The pre-stressing is done by wires or tendons placed spirally or over sectors of the circumference of the member. The wires or tendons lay outside the concrete core. Hence, the center of the pre-stressing steel, which we shall denote as CGS, is outside the core concrete section. The hoop compression generated is considered to be uniform across the thickness of a thin shell. Hence, the pressure line or C line lies at the center of the core concrete section which we shall denote as CGC. Thus, in circumferential pre-stressing, the pre-stressing wires or tendons lay outside a concrete core shell and it creates a hoop compression to resist the hoop tension that generates due to internal pressure. The CGS, that means the centroid of the pre-stressing steel lies outside the concrete section. And also, we assume that for thin cells, the stress across the thickness of the shell is uniform. Thus, the hoop compression that is generated coincides with the center of the concrete section. The following sketch shows the internal forces under surface conditions. The analysis is done for a slice of unit length along the longitudinal direction, which is parallel to the axis of the member. In this sketch, the pre-stressing tendon is lying outside the shell and it is creating a hoop compression where the compression is lying at the mid plane of the shell, which is the CGC. Due to the internal pressure P, there is a hoop tension, which is also lying at the center of the section. To reduce the loss of pre-stress due to friction, the pre-stressing can be done over sectors of the circumference. Buttresses are used for the anchorage of the tendons. The following sketch shows the buttresses along the circumference. Here you can see that the pre-stressing tendon is not continuous throughout the circumference. It has been broken up into sectors and it has been anchored in this buttresses. This reduces the friction loss that occurs during the circumferential pre-stressing. A close-up view of the buttress shows that 
one tendon is anchored at the left end which can be the dead end and the other tendon is anchored at the right end which can be the stretching end. Next we are moving on to the analysis and design under circumferential pre-stressing for general conditions. The basics of analysis and design for circumferential pre-stressing is provided for a general understanding. Specific applications such as pipes, liquid storage tanks and ring beams will be explained later. Analysis at transfer. The compressive stress can be calculated from the compression C that generates due to the pre-stressing force. From equilibrium C is equal to P0 where P0 is the pre-stress at transfer after short term losses. The compressive stress Fc is given as follows. Fc is equal to minus P0 by A where A is the area of the longitudinal section of the slice. The permissible pre-stress is determined based on Fc within the allowable stress at transfer which can be denoted as Fcc allowable. Thus, assuming that the hoop compression is uniform across the thickness, we are able to find out an expression of the compressive stress that generates due to the circumferential pre-stressing. And at transfer, this stress has to be less than the allowable compressive stress in the concrete at transfer. Next, we are moving on to analysis at service loads. The tensile stress due to the internal pressure P can be calculated from the tension T. From equilibrium of half of the slice, T is equal to P R where R is the radius of the mid surface of the cylinder. The resultant stress F C due to the effective pre stress which is denoted as P E and internal pressure is given as follows. F C is equal to minus P E by A plus P times R divided by A T. Here A T is the area of the transformed longitudinal section of the slice. The value of F C should be compressive and within allowable stress at service loads again which we are denoting as F C C allowable. Thus under service conditions the hoop tension adds up to the hoop compression and the total stress has two components one due to the pre-stressing force which is compressive and the other due to the internal pressure which is tensile. The resultant stress should be compressive and it should be within the allowable compressive value for service loads. In the previous equation, since P E is equal to P R and A T is greater than A, F C is always negative. Thus, the concrete will be under compression. To meet the safety standards, a factor of safety can be further introduced. From the previous expression, it can be noted since the effective pre-stress is equal to P times R which comes from the equilibrium of half of the slice and the area A T is greater than the area of the concrete A, F C will be always under compression. To this expression a further safety factor can be used depending upon the usage of the structure. The internal pressure P and the radius R are given variables. It is assumed that the pre-stressing steel alone carries the hoop tension due to internal pressure that is P E is equal to A P times F P E is equal to P R. Thus in design first we are assuming that the internal pressure is resisted by the pre-stressing force alone and then 
we are trying to find out a suitable combination of the radius of the shell and the thickness of the shell depending on the internal pressure P. The design steps are as follows. First, calculate the area of the pre-stressing steel from the equation A P is equal to P R divided by F P E. Thus, given the assumption that P E is equal to the internal pressure times the radius, we find out what is the amount of pre-stressing steel required in the unit length of the slice and that is equal to A P is equal to P R divided by F P E. Next, we are calculating the pre-stress at transfer from an estimate of the initial pre-stress F P 0 using the equation P 0 equal to A P divided times F P 0. Thus, once we have calculated A P and we know that how much pre-stress we can apply initially, based on that we are estimating P 0 and from that we can calculate the loss to get the effective free stress P E. Third, calculate the thickness of the concrete shell from the following equation. A is equal to P 0 divided by F C C allowable, where F C C allowable is the allowable compressive stress at transfer. Thus, the thickness should be adequate to resist the compressive stress that is generated after the transfer of pre-stress to the shell. The fourth step is calculate the resultant stress F C at the service conditions using equation 9 F dash 2. The value of F C should be within F C C allowable, the allowable stress at service conditions. Thus, once we have designed the section and the pre-stressing steel, we need to check the stress under service conditions and make sure that this stress is within the allowable value for the service condition. With this general introduction, we are moving on to specific applications. First, we shall study about pre-stressed concrete pipes. The pre-stressed concrete pipes are suitable when the internal pressure is within 0 0.5 to 2 Newton per millimeter square. There are two types of pre-stressed concrete pipes, first the cylinder type and second the non-cylinder type. A cylinder type pipe has a steel cylinder core over which the concrete is cast and pre-stressed. A non-cylinder type of pipe is made of pre-stressed concrete alone. Thus, there are two types of pre-stressed concrete pipes. In the first type, in the cylinder type, we first provide a steel cylinder over which the concrete is cast and it is pre-stressed. For a non-cylinder type, we are not providing any steel cylinder inside. It is the concrete itself that constitutes the section of the pipe. IS 784 2001, whose title is Pre-stressed Concrete Pipes Including Specials Specification, provides guidelines for the design of pre-stressed concrete pipes with the internal diameter ranging from 200 millimeter to 2500 millimeter. The pipes are designed to withstand the combined effect of internal pressure and external loads. The minimum grade of concrete in the core should be M40 for non-cylinder type pipes. Thus, there are some guidelines given is IS784 for the design of pre-stressed concrete pipes and depending upon the type of pipe that we select. First, the core is cast either by the centrifugal method or by the vertical casting method. In the centrifugal method, the mold is subjected to spinning 
till the concrete is compacted to a uniform thickness throughout the length of the pipe. In the vertical casting method, concrete is poured in layers up to a specified height. That means, the casting process of the concrete itself can be of two types. One is based on the spinning, where due to the centrifugal force, the concrete spreads around the circumference and this process is carried out till the thickness is uniform throughout the length of the pipe. And the second procedure of casting the concrete is the vertical casting method, where concrete is cast in layers depending upon the grade of concrete and depending upon the chances of segregation of the materials of concrete. After adequate curing of concrete, first the longitudinal wires are pre-stressed. Subsequently, the circumferential pre-stressing is done by the wire wound around the core in a helical form. The wire is wound using a counterweight or a die. Finally, a coat of concrete or rich cement mortar is applied over the wire to prevent from corrosion. For cylinder type pipes, first the steel cylinder is fabricated and tested, then the concrete is cast around it. Thus, depending upon the type of the pre concrete cylinder, we select the manufacturing process and the manufacturing process has to be strictly controlled for quality to get the best properties of the pre concrete pipes. Next, we are moving on to the analysis and design of pre-stress concrete pipes, which consider the stresses due to the following actions. A horizontal layout of the pipe is considered to illustrate them. The stress in the longitudinal direction are due to the following actions. First, longitudinal pre-stressing, which will be denoted as FL1. Second, circumferential pre-stressing, which will be denoted as FL2. Third, self-wet, which is denoted as FL3. Then, stresses due to transport and handling, which is denoted as FL4. The stress due to weight of the fluid inside the pipe, which is denoted as FL5. And finally, weight of soil above in case of pipes embedded in ground, which will be denoted as FL6. First, the longitudinal pre-stressing. The longitudinal pre-stressing generates a uniform compression, which is given as FL1 is equal to minus PE divided by AC1, where PE is the effective pre-stress under service conditions, and AC1 is the area of the concrete in the core. Second is the circumferential pre-stressing. Due to the Poisson's effect, the circumferential pre-stressing generates longitudinal tensile stress and that is given as FL2 is equal to 0 0.284 times PE divided by AC. The above expression estimates the Poisson's effect. Third, due to the self-wet, the pipe is not, if the pipe is not continuously supported, then a varying longitudinal stress generates due to the moment due to self-wet, which we shall denote as MSW. Thus, FL3 is equal to plus minus MSW divided by ZL, where ZL is a section modulus above the centroidal axis. Fourth, transport and handling, a varying longitudinal stress generates due to the moment during transport and handling which is denoted as MTH. The MTH can be determined based on the support points of the pipe. Thus, once the MTH is determined, we can find out the stress which is given as FL4 is equal to plus minus MTH divided by ZL. Fifth is the weight of fluid. Similar to self-wet, the moment due to weight of the fluid inside which is denoted as MF, generates varying longitudinal stress. 
and F L 5 is equal to plus minus M F divided by Z L. And finally, from the weight of the soil above that the weight of the soil above is considered to be an equivalent distributed load. The expression of stress F L 6 is similar to that for the weight of the fluid. The longitudinal stresses are combined based on the following diagram. Thus, on the left hand side, we are having a section of the pipe laid horizontally. The F L 1 is the uniform compressive stress due to the pre stressing force, then F L 2 is the effect due to the circumferential pre stressing, and this is generated due to the Poisson's effect and that is also uniform throughout the section. And then we have the varying stresses due to the moments due to several causes. One is the sulphate, second is the weight of the fluid, third is the transport and handling and finally, if there is some soil above the buried pipes, then all this should be considered to calculate the bending stresses that generate due to the flexure of the pipe. The stresses in the circumferential direction are due to the following actions. First, circumferential pre stressing, second, self weight, third, weight of the fluid, fourth, weight of soil above, fifth, live load, sixth, internal pressure, and these are denoted as FH1 to F H 6. First, the circumferential pre stressing. The compressive hoof stress, which is denoted as F H 1, is given as minus P S divided by A C 2, where P S is the tensile force in spiral wear in unit length of pipe. Note that this is different from the longitudinal pre stressing and SA 2 is the area of the longitudinal section of a unit length and this is, is equal to 1 times the thickness of the core. Thus, given the circumferential pre stressing, we can find out what is the stress generated in the circumferential direction. For the other causes, we should understand that due to a vertical load a thrust and a moment is generated in the circumferential direction. For 2 to 5 for each of these actions, first the vertical load per unit length which is denoted as W is calculated. The moment M and thrust T develop due to W across the thickness as shown in the sketch. Thus, it is due to the distortion of the pipe that we get the thickness, the thrust and the moment. Now, there are expressions to get the moment and the thrust depending on the value of W. The hoop stress at a point is calculated by the following equation F H is equal to plus minus M divided by Z H plus T divided by A. The expression of M and T due to W are as follows. M is equal to C M times W times R, T is equal to C T times W. Thus, what we find is that from the distortion of the section, we can calculate what is the moment and the thrust that generates due to a vertical load and from the moment and the thrust, we can find out what is the circumferential stress generating. Now, the coefficients C m and C t are tabulated in the code. In the previous equation, C m is the moment coefficient, C t is the thrust coefficient, W is the vertical load per unit length, R is the mean radius of pipe, a is area of longitudinal section for unit length of pipe, 
ZH is a section modulus for hoop stress for the same length which is given as 1 by 6 T square times 1000 millimeter cube per meter and T is the total thickness of core and coat. Values of CM and CT are tabulated in the code. Finally, we come for the internal pressure. The expression of the hoop stress is same as given in equation 9 F 2. F H 6 is equal to P R divided by A T, where P is the internal pressure and R is the min radius. The hoop stresses are combined based on the following diagram that first we have the, pre the effect of the circumferential pre stressing and which is inside the core only. Next we have the effect due to the vertical load and this generates a moment and a thrust. It gives a varying stress condition and finally, we have the internal pressure and if we consider that the full section is resisting the internal pressure, then again it is uniform throughout the section. Thus, we can add up this individual stresses to get the final stress at a point. Next, we are moving on to the liquid storage tanks. In the, construct, in the construction of concrete structures for the storage of liquids, the imperviousness of concrete is an important basic requirement. Hence, the design of such construction is based on avoidance of cracking in the concrete. The structures are pre-stressed to avoid tension in the concrete. In addition, pre-stressed concrete tanks require low maintenance. The resistance to seismic forces is satisfactory. The liquid storage tanks are pre-stressed primarily to avoid the cracking of concrete, which is the requirement for the liquid storage tanks. Also, once cracking is avoided, then the maintenance of such tanks is better and the performance under seismic forces is also satisfactory. Priestess concrete tanks are used in water treatment and distribution systems, wastewater collection and treatment system and storm water management. Other applications are liquefied natural gas which in short LNG containment structures large industrial process tanks and bulk storage tanks. Thus, the liquid storage tanks has wide application starting from the use of water and wastewater to other types of liquid storage which are used in the industrial processes. In this type of structures, first the concrete core is cast and cured. The surface is prepared by sand or hydroblasting. This is the outside surface. Next, the circumferential pre-stressing is applied by strand wrapping machine. Short crate is applied to provide a coat of concrete over the pre-stressing stands. A few photographs are provided for illustration. In the photograph, you can see, you can the strand wrapping machine is providing the circumferential pre-stressing about this tank. The tank has been first cast and cured. After that, this strand wrapping machine is providing the circumferential pre-stressing around this tank and a close-up view shows the pre-stressing strand which is being wrapped around the tank. Next, a short crit machine is used to provide a coat of concrete over the pre-stressing stand which checks the 
any corrosion of the pre stressing tanks. IS 3370-1967, the title is Code of Practice for Concrete Structures for the Storage of Liquids, provides guidelines for the analysis and design of liquid storage tanks. The four sections of the code are titled as follows, Part 1, General Requirement, Part 2, Reinforced Concrete Structures, Part 3, pre concrete structures and part 4 design tables. Thus, IS3370 is specifically mentioned for the liquid storage tanks and this code is divided into 4 parts. Part 3 is for the pre-stressed concrete liquid storage tanks. The analysis of liquid storage tanks can be done by IS 3370 1967 part 4 or by the finite element method. The code provides coefficients for bending moment, shear and hoop tension for cylindrical tanks which were developed from the theory of plates and shells. In part 4 both rectangular and cylindrical tanks are covered. Since circular pre-stressing is applied to cylindrical tanks, only this type of tank is covered in this module. Thus, the part 4 of IS3370 gives us guidelines for the analysis of liquid storage tanks. There are guidelines for both rectangular and cylindrical tanks, but since circular pre-stressing is applicable for cylindrical tanks, we shall concentrate only on those type of tanks. The following types of boundary conditions are considered in the analysis of the cylindrical wall. Number 1 for based, fixed or hinged, for top free or hinged or framed. The applicability of each boundary condition is explained next. For base, when the wall is built continuous with its footing then the base can be considered to be fixed as the first approximation. If the subgrade is susceptible to settlement, then a hinged base is a conservative assumption. Since the actual rotational restraint from the footing is somewhere in between fixed and hinged, a hinged base can be assumed. The base can be even made sliding with appropriate polyvinyl chloride or PVC water stops for liquid tightness. Thus, the main two types of the boundary condition at the bottom of the cylindrical wall is either fixed or hinged. If the soil is subjected to settlement, then a hinged assumption is a conservative assumption for the bottom of the cylindrical wall. Next, for the top, if the top of the wall is considered free when there is no restraint in expansion. When the top is connected to the roof slab by dowels or shear trans transfer, the boundary condition can be considered to be hinged. Finally, when the top of the wall and the roof slab are made continuous with moment transfer, the top is considered to be framed. Because again, depending upon the connection between the wall and the roof slab, we have to judge what is the boundary condition at the top, whether it is free, hinged or framed. The analysis is based on the boundary conditions. The hydrostatic pressure on the wall increases linearly from the top to the bottom of the liquid of maximum possible depth. If the vapor pressure in the free board is negligible, then the pressure at the top is 0, else it is added throughout the depth of the pressure of the liquid. The forces generated in the tank due to circumferential pre-stress are opposite in nature to that due to hydrostatic pressure. If the tank is built underground, then the earth pressure needs to be considered. Thus, the hoop tension 
generates due to the hydrostatic pressure due to the liquid stored in the tank. The design is based on the maximum liquid that can be stored in the tank and the triangular hydrostatic pressure is used to calculate the hoop stress. If there is some vapor pressure above the liquid free board, then that has to be also included and finally, if the tank is buried underground, then the earth pressure also has to be included. Now, the most severe condition should be used to design the tank, whether the empty condition or whether the full condition, all these conditions has to be checked to find out the design stresses. The hoop tension in the wall generated due to a triangular hydrostatic pressure is given as follows. T is equal to C T times W times H times R. The bending moment in the vertical direction is given as follows. M is equal to C M times W times H cube. The shear at the base is given by the following expression. V is equal to C V times W times H square. In the previous equations, the notations used are as follows. C T is equal to coefficient for hoop tension, C m is a co coefficient for bending moment, C v is a coefficient for shear, W is a unit weight of liquid, H is the height of the liquid, R is the inner radius of the wall. Thus, the analysis is based on the coefficients that is given in IS 3370 part 4 and these coefficients are developed from the theory of plates and shells and once the coefficient is known, we can calculate what is the hoop tension and the moment and the shear that generates in the section of the tank. The values of the coefficients are tabulated in IS 3370 1967 part 4 for various values of h square divided by d t at different depths of the liquid. D and T represents the inner diameter and the thickness of the wall respectively. The typical variations of C T and C M with depth for two sets of boundary conditions are illustrated. In this sketch, the tank section is fixed at the bottom and free to slide at the top. The hydrostatic pressure if the tank is completely full is triangular and then the variation of the coefficient for the hoop tension is as follows and the variation of the coefficient for the moment about the vertical direction is shown like this. Thus, at the base we have a negative moment whereas, beyond that we have positive moment and the hoop tension also achieves a maximum value in an intermediate height. The second case is for a hinged base where the foundation may tilt, the top is free to slide and again due to the triangular hydrostatic pressure, we have the tabulated values of C T and C M. Note that in this case, there is no negative moment at the base and the section is always under positive moment. The roof can be made of a dome supported at the edges on the cylindrical wall, else the roof can be a flat slab supported on columns along with the edges. IS 3370 1967 part 4 provides coefficients for the analysis of the floor and roof slabs. That means, similar to the analysis of the cylindrical wall, we can also analyze the floor and the roof slab based on the moment coefficients that is given in the code and once we get the moments, we can design for the reinforcement and the pre-stressing steam like a conventional design. IS 3370 
1916 part 3 provides design requirements for pre-stress tanks. A few of them are mentioned. The computed stress in the concrete and steel during transfer, handling and construction and under working loads should be within the permissible values as specified in IS 1343-1980, which is the code for pre-stress concrete. Second, the liquid retaining phase should be checked against cracking with a load factor of 1.2. Thus, sigma C L divided by sigma W L should be greater than or equal to 1.2, where sigma C L is the stress under cracking load and sigma W L is the stress under working load. Values of limiting tensile strength of concrete for estimating the cracking load are specified in the code. Third, the ultimate load at failure should not be less than twice the working load. And fourth, when the tank is full, there should be a compression in the concrete at all points of at least 0 0.7 Newton per millimeter square. When the tank is empty, there should not be tensile stress greater than 1 Newton per millimeter square. Thus, IS 3370 part 3 gives us guidelines specifically for pre-stress concrete tanks and these guidelines should be used during the design of the pre-stress concrete tanks. There should be provision to allow for elastic distortion of the structure during pre-stressing. Any restraint that may lead to the reduction of the pre-stressing force should be considered. Thus, when the pre-stressing is done, if there is some restraint, then there can be a drop in the pre-stressing force and that should be considered in the analysis and design of the pre-stress concrete tank. IS 3370 part 3 also provides detailing requirements. The cover requirement is as follows. The minimum cover to the pre-stressing wires should be 35 millimeter on the liquid phase. For phase away from the liquid, the cover requirements are as per IS 1343. Other requirements from IS 1343 are also applicable. Next, we are moving on to the analysis of ring beams. The ring beams are used in presence of domes. We are showing this for a typical nuclear containment structure. In this sketch, the dome is the circular member at the top and this is supported on the ring beams. Then we have the cylindrical wall and this is supported on a raft foundation. Thus, ring beams support domes in buildings, tanks, silos and nuclear containment structures. Circular pre-stressing is applied on a dome by a grid of tendons. The cylindrical wall is pre-stressed circumferentially as well as vertically and the ring beam is circumferentially pre-stressed. Thus, in a nuclear containment structure, the dome, the ring beam, the cylindrical wall are all pre-stressed and even the raft foundation may be pre-stressed. This sketch shows some details of the pre-stressing tendons that this is at the junction of the dome and the ring beam. The dome is circularly pre-stressed by tendons which are first anchored, then the cylindrical wall is pre-stressed in the vertical direction. The wall is also pre-stressed by tendons in the circumferential direction and the ring beam which is at the base of this dome is also circumferentially pre-stressed. This figure shows a containment structure from the Kaiga atomic power plant and here you can see that the dome is supported on a ring beam and then the cylindrical wall will be supported on the raft foundation. 
The analysis of a ring beam is based on a load symmetric about the vertical axis. Since the dome is not supposed to carry any moment at the edge, the resultant reaction at the ring beam is tangential. Thus, if we take a free body diagram of the dome, the reaction at the support is tangential. This relates the horizontal thrust on the dome and the vertical reaction on the dome. R is the radius of the dome and theta is half of the angle that is subtended by the dome. Let the total vertical load from the dome be W. The vertical reaction per unit length which is denoted as V is given as follows. V is equal to W divided by 2 pi times R sin theta. Here R is the radius of the dome and theta is the half of the angle subtended by the dome. The horizontal thrust is calculated from the condition of the reaction to be tangential. The value per unit length is given as follows. H is equal to V cot theta is equal to W cot theta divided by 2 pi R sin theta. The thrust is resisted by the effective pre-stressing force P E in the ring beam. P E can be estimated from the equilibrium of half of the ring beam. Thus, given the internal the pressure which is due to the horizontal thrust from the dome, we are able to calculate what is the effective pre-stress. This P E is given as H times R sin theta which is similar to the general formula that we had seen earlier and once we substitute the value of H, we get the effective pre-stress that is required in the ring beam to support the dome and P E is given as W cot theta divided by 2 pi. Thus, we have seen that the ring beam can be designed based on the thrust that the dome applies on the ring beam. The analysis for the dome and the cylindrical wall is based on the requirements of the nuclear containment structure and these structures have to be analyzed by special methods like the finite element method and then once we determine what are the forces and stresses coming in the domes and in the wall, we will be able to design the pre-stressing steel for them. Finally, today we are concluding for this pre-stressed concrete course. The pre-stressed concrete is observed in other types of structural elements such as bridge decks, shells and folded plates, offshore concrete gravity structures, pavements and raft foundations. The analysis of special structures is based on advanced theory of structural analysis or the finite element method. After the analysis, the design of such structures follow the basic principles of pre-stressed concrete design. It is expected that in future, future uh, further innovations in structural form, pre-stressing systems and construction technology will promote the application of pre-stressed concrete. Thus, what we covered in this course gives you a beginner's impression of pre-stressed concrete. We had covered from the actually loaded members, then we moved on to the flexure, then we moved on to the shear, torsion. We also studied about the losses in pre-stress, the material properties and we looked into the design of the end zones of pre-stress members. Then we moved on to the special topics 
we studied about the composite construction, we also studied about the two way slabs, one way slabs, we studied about the compression members and finally, today we studied about the circular pre-stressing. Thus, the application of pre-stressed concrete is wide and in future with the development of different pre-stressing systems, structural forms and bold design, we are expected to see more and more application of pre-stressed concrete. Now, the analysis of special structures needs the understanding of theory of plates and shells and the use of finite element method by a robust software package. Now, once we can analyze this sophisticated structures, then the design of the pre-stressing tendons and the reinforcement follows the principles that we have studied in this course. We also have to be aware of the material properties and the local stresses that generates near the anchorage. The losses of pre-stress is also important which needs to be studied for any type of pre-stress concrete structure. Thus, in future we will be able to design even better and more economic and efficient structural forms by the use of pre-stress concrete. A few photos of recent applications of pre-stress concrete is shown. In this photograph, you can see a cement silo. This is a shell type of structure which stores cement. Similar type of silos can be used for storing food grains or any other granular material and these industrial structures can be analyzed by either by a conventional analysis or by the finite element method. Once we analyze this shell, then we can design the pre-stressed concrete section as per the fundamental principles that we have learned in this course. This figure is that of a curved box girder bridge. We had discussed about the applications of pre-stress concrete in bridges. Although in this course, we have studied only prismatic sections and that two eye girders, straight eye girders, but pre-stress concrete is also used for curved box girder bridges. Now, this type of box girders needs special analysis and we need to also consider the effects of the distortion of the box girders. Now, once we have analyzed the curved box girder, then the design for the pre-stressing steel follows based on the fundamental principles of pre-stress concrete. And this curved box girders are very elegant and they are signature structures in a metropolitan environment. Before we end, I mention the different codes related with pre-stress concrete that is published by the Bureau of Indian Standards. First is the IS 784-2001, which is the pre-stress concrete pipes including fittings specification. The IS 1343-1980, code of practice for pre-stress concrete. This is the code that we followed mostly in our course. Next, IS 1678-1998, specification for pre-stress concrete poles for overhead power, traction and telecommunication lines. IS 1785-1983, specification for plain hard drawn steel wear for pre-stress concrete. Part 1, coal drawn stress relieved wear, part 2, as drawn wear. IS 2090-1983, specification for high tensile steel bars used in pre-stress concrete. IS 2193-1986, specification for precast, pre-stressed concrete steel lighting poles. 
IS 13, 3370 1967 Code of Practice for Concrete Structures for Storage of Liquids. Here, PERT 3 is the one which is specifically used for the Pristus concrete structures. IS 6003 1983 Specification for Indented Ware for Pristus concrete. IS 6006 1983 Specification for uncoated stress relief strand for Priestess concrete. IS 6461-1973, glossary of terms related to cement concrete of which part 11 is related with Priestess concrete. IS 10790-1984, methods of sampling of steel for pre-stressed and reinforced concrete. Part 1 is of pre-stressing steel, part 2 is of reinforcing steel. IS 13158-1991, specification for pre-stressed concrete circular spun poles for overhead power, traction and telecommunication lines. IS 14268-1995, specification for uncoated stress relieved low relaxation 7 ply strand for pre-stressed concrete. The following code related with pre-stressed concrete is published by the Indian Roads Congress, IRC 18, 2000, design criteria for pre-stressed concrete bridges and post-tension concrete. This code is the one which is specifically used for pre-stressed concrete but there are other codes published by the Indian Road Congress which is related with the analysis and design of road bridges. And when you are moving into the carrier, you have to learn this, the use of these codes depending upon where you are using the knowledge of priestess concrete. Thus, in today's lecture, we first gave an introduction of circular pre-stressing. We understood what is the necessity of circumferential pre-stressing. Then we learned the general analysis and design principles for circumferential pre-stressing. Next, we studied some special applications. First, we studied pre-stressed concrete pipes. Next, we studied liquid storage tanks and finally, we studied ring beams. We got familiar with the codes that are related with pre-stressed concrete structures and we hope that you had a wonderful time with this course. Thank you.